and good news that the Lord Jesus is ridden, risen and now has dominion over all heaven and earth. Amen. Our next hymn is in your bullet, it's in your uh, hymn book, number 225. Come, Christians join to sing. Let's worship our God who is risen from the dead. Give humility, honesty, 
wisdom, courage to all those to obey you, to our president, to our Congress, our governor, and all those who minister in your name. Give us that we would live quiet and peaceable lives of godliness before you. And we also think of those who are now suffering, they're afflicted in soul or body. Comfort those who are mourning. Hearten those who are needy and especially those who are enduring persecution. Have mercy on those who are sick and, and even those who are dying. Be near to those who suffer war and famine. Raise up your children by your mighty outstretched hand. <coughs> Hear us for Jesus' sake. For we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's that part of the service we ask that you'd stand up, take a deep breath of celestial air, as Dr. Joe likes to say. Greet one another in the name of our Lord Jesus, who is risen in me. said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and I can put my finger print into the nails, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, doors being shut, stood in the midst, said, Peace to you. He said to Thomas, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand in here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And bless the reading of his holy and inspired word to us. Just a few announcements for you this morning. The first, you can see them printed there, is that we have men's breakfast tomorrow morning, all the men of the church, 8.30 across the way in Warner Hall. For those of you who are joining us 
It's a simple breakfast, but a wonderful uh, study that we've been doing through C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. Uh, it's just been a wonderful edification time of fellowship, so I encourage you to, to come out to that. In addition, each Wednesday morning at 10.30, uh, we have uh, a wonderful study given by Dr. R.C. Sproul on the foundations of the Christian faith. He's going through how does the Bible and all these various uh, scriptures, how do they fit together? Uh, for God is a God of order and not a God of chaos. And he does so wonderfully. We have a time for prayer and, and fellowship uh, in addition to that. So I encourage you, 10.30 on Wednesdays across the way in Warner Hall, join us even if you haven't yet joined. Last week we had the great pleasure of welcoming many new members, and in my haste I neglected to mention one of the new members. I won't make her stand. Maybe she could poke her hand up. <laughs> Carolyn Schneider, I just wanted to, everyone to know that she is, is one of our members. We can clap for her too. We, we Sorry, no members. We love you. And now, um, you see birthdays and anniversaries that are listed there, but we have a, a wonderful gift for our church this morning, uh, a wonderful celebration of the sacrament of, of baptism, where we'll be baptizing a new member into the body of Christ, Chuan Wong, and Dr. Joe will say a few words before we actually do the baptism. In the Christian church, there are two special ordinances instituted by Christ himself to remind us of our great salvation. <clears throat> These ordinances have to do with our senses. We can see them, we can smell them, we can touch them, we can feel them. And one of them, of course, is the sacrament of communion, which is the Lord's Supper. And in that, it portrays the whole gist of what salvation is all about. His body broken for us in our place. He took the wrath of God the justice of God due to us, he took. And then, of course, the wonderful rite of baptism, which is the washing with water. The washing in water showing that our pollution is washed away, our spiritual pollution is washed away by the blood of Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so the water uh, is shed, so it shows us that we are washed and made clean in his sight. It's also a sign of our engrafting into Christ and into his life. We are now a part of him. And so the, Paul says we are baptized into his death, into his burial, and also into his resurrection. Now the word baptism is used throughout the scriptures and it's not always referring to water, much less the mood as to how it's to be done. And so consequently, we know that uh, in the New Testament, the word baptism on some occasions is used where it could not be done by immersion. It had to be done by a simpler method. And so in Mark chapter 7, we read that the mode was, when the Pharisees came from the marketplace, they went through this ceremonial cleansing. And they had those great water pots that Jesus used to make the water into wine. They had those, they collected the rainwater. And when they would come from the marketplace, because they had been rubbing elbows with the Gentiles, they felt defiled, so they had to clean themselves. Well, what they did was they reached into the water pot and they would sprinkle themselves. Now, oft times they would even sprinkle the table and the chairs, the couches before they were going to sit down. That rite is continued over in a superstitious way in what the Roman church calls holy water. We don't have holy water, but the rite is the same. And the idea is of cleansing, the need of cleansing. And the word for use that's used there in Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 4, is the word baptizo. So we know that they didn't soak a couch in the immersion pool and then sit on a soggy couch to have their lunch. We know that wasn't possible. The other thing is that by our mode of sprinkling, which is a New Testament uh, expression of the Old Testament word used 50 times in the Old Testament, uh, we know that it can be done anytime, any place, anywhere, which is in sympathy with the gospel. The gospel can be done anytime, any place, anywhere. People can believe it. And so in baptism, we don't make it hard for people to be initiated into church. I'm so thrilled today that God has put it into the heart of Sean to want to be a member of the body of Christ, to confess him as her Lord and Savior. And I am thrilled today to say that we will welcome her uh, in this initiatory rite. 
So at this time, I'm going to ask that Sean, if you'll present yourself over here by the baptismal font. And because she has such a connection uh, with Johnny and with uh, uh, with the Pastor uh, over here, uh, Jones, uh, I'm going to allow him to initiate this as she stands here. I'd like Erickson. Would you stand with her, please? Well, we're so glad to have you. And we just want to say thanks to God for the work of the Holy Spirit that he has done in your heart. Uh, we're rejoicing for this day with you. Um, I have a few questions. We've already talked about these in the past. But to formalize things, uh, I think it's, it's healthy. Do you, Schwam, confess your faith in God, your Father, in the Lord Jesus, your Savior, and in the sanctifying Holy Spirit? Yes. I do. Do you repent of all your sins and uh, put your trust in the mercy of the Lord Jesus? Yes, I do. And do you promise to make diligent use of this means of grace and, grace and be a, a faithful member of the church? Yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> And this is a wonderful opportunity for each of us to now reflect upon our baptism and, and live up to these same vows before the Lord Jesus ourselves. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are Almighty God, and we, we thank you for this ordinance, this sacrament of, of baptism that we can celebrate <laughs> together, gathering in your name. We ask that you would graciously accept Schwang as your servant that all her sins would be washed away, being born again of water and the Spirit. Sanctify her by this, uh, by this your Spirit. We ask that you would remain with her, help her to abide in the Lord Jesus, and be saved. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now, Schwang. baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Now let us continue our service today uh, and preparing for our offering with the hymn 589.
happening in today. They are giving you a chance to really dig into your pockets. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh Lord, it's a wonderful thing when you speak to your children in the hours of the night when restlessness and sleep has evaded us. Uh, and yet you were there. While we slumber, you don't slumber, you don't sleep, you watch over us. We can't thank you enough for that watch care. But now you've called us to also sit by the bedside of those who are weak, and to pray for those who have not, cannot pray for themselves, to love the unlovely, to go where none others want to go, to kiss the leper's spots till they be clean. Lord, you call us to do so many things that by nature we would so rebel against, but by Jesus Christ setting for us the example and loving us so we, O oh Lord, can do your work. Accept the offerings we bring this day. Help us to buy a bucket of oats for the horse that carries our missionary up into the mountains to preach the word to those descendants from the Aztecs and the Incas and the Mayan Indians. Bless the work among the Kichuas today. Bless, O oh Lord, your work among the Jewish people that many will be hearing the gospel and the veil removed from their sight so that they can see Christ as the Messiah. Bless the Lord our part as we support the work in Norway and help that church to get established. Bless us in the work here at home, O oh Father, and our work that has to be done. As you have brought us into being, so continue to stay with us and bless us. Thank you for the joy of Schwann coming to know you Amen. in a personal way, confessing her faith. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for the ministry that we have and we share together. Bless now the gifts we bring to you, that there might be provision in this place to do all your holy will. For we ask it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
glad you're joining us. Welcome. Don't run off after the service. We have a lovely uh, fellowship time afterwards in the palm room. But now let's stand, sing the doxology and praise our God. Speak through your written word and make me to see some wonderful truth you have to show to me for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The scripture lesson was read in your hearing this morning. And I'm uh, somewhat congested today, so there'll be no kissing after the service today. <laughs> <laughs> the bowing and scraping and kissing toes is always in order, so <laughs> uh, you can think about that. Well, this is the eighth day after Easter Sunday. And if you were at church on Easter Sunday, you know what a grand and glorious celebration it was. <coughs> so it was in the New Testament. After our Lord appeared to the disciples uh, at that wonderful time in the evening, uh, they saw him and they showed that he was alive and he said to them, received the Holy Spirit and he breathed on them. But somebody wasn't there. And I like to play games sometimes and try to think, why would the Lord do things that he does? And I know that he does everything to benefit his children, us. I know that, for instance, after our Lord was risen from the dead, he made it a specific point to go find the Apostle Peter because Peter had denied him, remember? Three times. And so he had to go restore Peter. So he does. He, he went out and he found Peter. And he restored him. And the full restoration will come in the 20th chapter when they're by the seaside having breakfast. But I also know that he went to find his, his half-brother James. Uh, James was a Pharisee and he wasn't a believer until the resurrection. And then he became a believer. And Jesus went to James. And now suddenly, all the mystery of growing up with brother Jesus, all the mystery that surrounded his birth, and all the things, the questions that we hid inside, we didn't want to ask our mother about was he legitimate or how did that happen. All those questions were now resolved as he saw Jesus. So he went after James. So he goes after the ones that are so important to him but there's somebody else who's important to him, but he didn't go after him. For one week, he stewed in his juices of unbelief and doubt. And I'm referring to the fellow whose name is Thomas. Thomas, the word itself means the twin. He's the twin. We don't even know who his twin was. We just know that he's Thomas the twin. Hey, do you know Thomas? You mean Thomas the twin? Yes. Thomas the twin. He wasn't with him on Easter Sunday night. And we don't know where he was. The Bible doesn't tell us where he was. It may be important, it may not be important. If it was, I guess God would have told us. All we know is that for one whole week, he kept hearing that Jesus is alive, but he couldn't believe it. And then the scripture lesson that was read in your hearing, it's a wonderful passage of scripture. Thomas just asked them, he said, you keep telling me that he's alive, but unless I put my finger, because I saw him, I saw what they did to him. I saw the nail driven in his quivering flesh. I saw and I heard the cross when it dropped into the socket and every bone was out of joint. I saw him. And unless I put my finger in the print of the nail, my hand in his side. I can't believe. Everything was dashed to pieces. 
for Thomas. And for a whole week he labored in unbelief. And I keep thinking this, how often in life do we go through the hard times when the help is there, but we just don't avail ourselves of it. The people of God, the people of faith have been through the trials that we've been through. And they're there to help us. They've been through it. We're not Dick Tracy and we're not the Lone Ranger. Uh, we've been through these things. Others have been through them and they can be a help. Uh, I almost don't want to mention it, but I will. Uh, it was about a year ago that Carolyn Snyder's husband, Roger, passed from this life into the next. And here's a place where we share burdens. Burdens are lifted in the company of other people. It's a place where we go through life together. And the road that we traveled, Sean, you need to know it's a rocky road, but it's the fellowship that makes it so grand. Mm. It's being with people who have been where we are. And it's a non-judgmental road. We can't judge. Like the old roller derby. <laughs> when they would go around, they would reach behind them, and they would grab their team member and push him way up ahead in order to win. But once he was up ahead, he couldn't look back because the very hand that helped him up might fall. And so it is with us. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. So as long as we realize that we're doing a balancing act, listen, becoming a Christian requires a miracle, but staying Christian is a greater miracle. Mm. God has to sustain us. Mm. And here's poor Thomas, and he's going through all this time by himself, going through, I don't know if there's anybody listening or out there who's going through a terrible time of doubt, guilt, depression, whatever it may be. There's help. The people of God are here. He's left the church in the world to be a healing institution. We're not a holy club. We're a hospital. A hospital for saints and sinners. We're a place where people come to find restoration. Amen. Now let me say who is Thomas? You know, we don't know very much about him. We really don't. We know he's named in all four Gospels as one of the disciples. And then the disciple, Jesus chose of the disciples, many students. He chose 12 to be apostles, teachers. So that's the difference between an apostle and a disciple. A disciple is a student. An apostle is now sent forth to be a teacher. So he's chosen, he's one of the twelve to be chosen as a teacher. And there we find him on several occasions. Six months before Calvary, or maybe it was six weeks, and Lazarus was dead. He's the brother of Mary and Martha, they loved him so. And he's dead, and Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm to make Lazarus uh, alive. Uh, I'm going to restore him to health. And Thomas and the disciples, the, the other the apostles, when they, they didn't want to go. Lord, don't you know that there's a, a bounty on your head? There's a death warrant out? Don't go. Let's not go there. And Jesus said, no, we're going up. I set my face steadfastly. The Bible says steadfastly. Steadfastly means you put your shoulder against the door and somebody's trying to get in and you're trying to keep them out. You are steadfastly holding on. And Jesus determined steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, to suffer many things. And you know what? Thomas said this. Fellas, let's go with him. That we may die with him. So he's not a coward, is he? Thomas is not a coward. Let's go with him that we may die with him. <clears throat> Peter said, I'll lay down my life. But Thomas said, let's go that we may die with him. I think Thomas there had thought it through and he knew the opposition was there. And yet he's willing to die with him. I have another picture of him. It's in that upper room. They've come for the Passover meal. And Jesus is doing many stories, telling them lots of things that they need to know. It's last minute instructions for when I'm not here. And he's telling them about heaven. And it's a wonderful place. And he's going to prepare it. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you'll be also. And then you have all these questions that come in. Thomas has a question too. Philip has a question. 
Lord, show us the Father, and that will satisfy us. And so Jesus says to him, oh, Philip, have you not known me? He that hath seen me has actually seen God the Father in me. You've seen what I've done. No man could do this. It's God doing it. And then one says, Lord, how can we know the way? We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. So we have Thomas speaking out there, asking these questions, interrupting each other at the meal. And now we come to Easter Day and the crucifixion has happened just as Jesus said it would. Who crucified Christ? The greatest legal system that earth ever had. Rome crucified Christ. It went against its own teaching. The greatest religion that the world had ever seen, the enlightenment of Israel. People came from all over the world to be in the temple of the living and true God whose name is Yahweh. The I am that I am. Crucified Christ. The greatest culture of all the world, the Greek culture, crucified Christ. So you have all the best that the world has to offer and yet all had a hand in the bloody death of the Son of God. All turned against him. Now, here in this place, they got together and they they said, Thomas, we're going to meet again Sunday. Sunday night, first day of the week. Won't you come and be a part of it? I wrote a little poem about it some years ago. I wrote it for myself, but Betsy told me, go ahead and share it. So I did. They gathered in that upper room on that first Easter day. The Lord appeared right in their midst, but Thomas was away. No one knows just where he went from Calvary's awful scene. For Thomas, all his hopes went dead. If only it were a dream. Then the disciples find him at last. Thomas, believe us, he's alive. It's true. We all got together, but we couldn't find you. Why won't you believe us? How do you explain? We're laughing. We're happy. Do our faces show pain? We've seen him. We swear it. Why won't you believe? If only you'd been here, you'd no longer grieve. We're meeting tonight. Please come for the meal. We'll tell you more. You can judge if it's real. And then Thomas speaks. Yes, I'll come. But you know what I need? I must touch his hand where I saw his palm bleed. My hand, nothing less to touch the wound in his side. Only then will I know Jesus is truly alive. And that very night, they all found their way to the room where they met on that first Easter day. And Thomas, the doubter, but he wondered what for. For fear of the Jews, they again bolted the door. What proof could they offer that he would receive? Then suddenly appeared Jesus, the proof to believe. And he commanded the doubter, come, touch me and see. Thomas put forth his finger and knew it was he. The Christ whom he loved now blessed him and said, because you have seen me, you know I'm not dead. My Lord and my God, his faith restored that night. And Jesus said, but blessed are those who will believe without sight. And so here you have this wonderful occasion yeah. and this special reason why God didn't seek to it that Thomas was with them Easter. Because he knew there'd be others like us without the resurrection. So he allowed this disciple, this apostle, to skip the meeting in order that eventually he might bring him to full faith because he embodies everything, everything that a doubter embodies. I can't believe that a dead man rises. Now, incidentally, when Thomas looks at Jesus and Jesus gives him the command, he doesn't just say, Thomas, in a very meek voice, Thomas, I hope you'll believe me now that you've seen me. <laughs> it's in the imperative in the Greek, which means this, Thomas! It's a shout, all capital letters in the vocabulary and in the voice. Thomas does, he doesn't want to do it, but the Lord's commanded him, do it. You've got to do this, unseemly as it may be. And now the Lord says, Thomas, 
Thomas. And it's imperative. He says, I command you, bring forth faith. And that's nothing less than that. The command of God, bring forth faith. And faith floods in like light coming in a window and making the darkness disappear. And in Thomas's eyes and mind and law, he, now he knows, he knows in his heart that Jesus is truly alive. Was he mistaken? No, he wasn't mistaken. Now, if he just saw Jesus alive, that's one thing. That's very good. But remember, he saw Jesus do this for others. He saw Lazarus resurrected. He saw Jairus' daughter resurrected from the dead. And he saw that wonderful young man on a, a way to be buried in a little village of Nain. There was a mother, and she was a widow. She had a son, an only son, and he was her life and joy. And she loved him so, and he got sick and he died. And now they're on the way to the funeral. Jesus interrupted the funeral. And he gives the son back to the mother alive. So resurrections have happened before. So Thomas is seeing the resurrection of Jesus, except that he's putting two and two together. And here's what he's remembering. In each case, Jesus raised somebody from the dead. But here Jesus had been telling them every time he spoke of the cross, he said this, that I will be crucified, I'll be buried, but I will rise myself, raise myself from the dead and ascend into heaven. Every time he talked about the cross, he talked about his ascension mm. and his resurrection. That he would do it. He would accomplish it. Now, if you take your Bible and carefully plot your way through it, you'll find this. Who raised Jesus from the dead? He said he would raise himself from the dead. The Bible also says that God raised Jesus from the dead. The Father raised him from the dead. I read another place in Acts that the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. It is the mighty work of God to raise Jesus from the dead. And Jesus, now Thomas knows, he is my Lord and my God. He is my God. And it's right to worship him. It's right to bring honor to him. It's right to believe now all that he said, that he was dying in my place. I got a pamphlet, an invitation from a cult to come to a meeting. And in their theology is this, Jesus didn't die for you. He could only die for one man, Adam. And you've got to work out your own salvation. No, no, Jesus died for those who put their trust in him. So I'm thankful that Thomas wasn't there. <coughs> Blessed omissions as well as commissions. Each of the apostles, he got them together, but he didn't get Thomas. He went after Peter, he went after James, but he didn't go after Thomas. And later on, a week later, after he, Thomas reaches the very bottom, so that he had to reach, have you ever been so low you've got to reach up to touch bottom? Mm -hmm. In life, sometimes we go through times like that. But oh, how glorious it is to know that this is true, this is real. And I like, some of you are too young to remember Chuck Colson. He was known as the, the hitman for Nixon. He was, a, he was a, a powerful house, probably one of the most powerful men in Washington. And they participated in a robbery called the Watergate. And in the Watergate, they broke into the headquarters of the Democrats and they stole some information. Then they tried to cover it up. And they got all their stories together. They tried to cover it up. And it went as high as the President of the United States that caused him to have to resign his office. And Colson, when he knew now that it was raveling, unraveling, and he was going to go to jail, sat in his driveway and he listened to somebody who witnessed to him about Jesus Christ and his need to be born again. And now for the first time, this powerful man's life crashed in front of him. He became a Christian. He put his hands in the hand of the man who stills the water. He became a believer. And I love what he says. I put it there for you. I know that the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate, that boxed robbery, proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus rise, raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, 
tortured, stoned, put in prison. They would not have endured that if it were not true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. Hmm. You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Hmm. So the apostle Peter says, we have not followed cunningly devised wives' fables. We have not just taken stories here and there and made a, a, a saintly story out of them. No, these things are the gospel truth. He's alive. Amen. Thomas bowed before him and said, my Lord and my God. What's your response? Now, if you tell me, well, I believe in Jesus, my question is this. Faith doesn't do anything. Faith in facts doesn't do anything. It's faith in the facts and the influence that the facts have on our lives that saves us. Now, watch what I say carefully. There's no such thing as just a plan of salvation. <coughs> There's no plan. It's a person. And when we put our lives into the life and into the hands of this person, and it stimulates us, and it activates us, and it causes us a new way of thinking, and that's what the Bible's all about, to give us this new way of thinking, new way of living. When we put our hands and our lives into this person and these facts, and these facts are true, then they come alive in us and begin to grow. And we find ourselves doing things that we never thought we would do, like loving other people, like wanting to be the church, like wanting to participate in thy kingdom come, we say. Amen. But the problem with us is that we believe the facts, but we're not allowing them to influence us. Amen. If you're a Christian and you're watching this by live stream, know that I'm thankful for you. But if you've got enough gumption and guts and ability to get up and go to the grocery store, guess what? You should be in a church somewhere. Beloved, we're not here to judge. We're here just to help. So I, I encourage you, let the facts be the influence. Now, uh, if you're a believer, where's your treasure? Mm. Jesus said where a man's mm. treasure is, there his heart also. Amen. And where his heart is, that's where his treasure's going to be. What are the things you're supporting in life? Mm. Where is your investment going? Are you buying a bucket of oats for that horse in Peru so he can climb up the mountain? Or are you helping us as we support a church that has no friends really in a place called Norway and they're establishing it and getting a church going and preaching an evangelical gospel and not a state-owned liturgical gospel that has driven people away from the church because it's cold mm. and it's lifeless, it's not doing anything. You remember Paul says that the scriptures are words and they can be deadly. There has to be the spirit breathed upon them. So we're trying to get a church started there. Mm. Are you supporting... Our dear friend Greg, I won't tell you his last name, as he tries to minister at all the fairs and all the country fairs that mm -hmm. they have all around the world and around the country, ministering to Jewish people to show them Jesus is the Messiah. Have you done anything to spread the gospel to your neighbors? Mm -hmm. See, that's the influence of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, we could be like sit in soakers. We just sit and soak. Oh, I love it. It makes me feel good. And I wanted to do that. If you leave here feeling worse than when you came in, I didn't do my job because gospel means good news. But if you leave here and you feel a little bit of a pinch somewhere that might be saying, the Holy Spirit saying, enough of this foolishness. You want to know where your kingdom is? Get out your checkbook. And see the things that you love. And see the things that you give. I ate in a restaurant the other day, took somebody out. I wouldn't have done it, but Betsy picked the place. <laughs> <laughs> the meal was $100. The service was okay. I'm a big tipper. I admire people who work in the industry. So I tipped $20, and I grieved over every time I wrote the number. <laughs> but that was the tip. Some people tip more to the waiter than they do to the living God. How is it with you when the books will be opened 
and the things that we love are there. Thomas became a believer. Let me tell you what he did, and then I close the lesson. Incidentally, I marvel that there are very few of the apostles talked about. You probably can't name them all. I, I have a hard time giving them this too. I know Nathaniel, Philip, and some of these others. They all went somewhere. That's why we don't hear about them. Selectively, the book would be forever. So God just picked a few of these to give us the concise record of salvation. Thomas went to India. And in India, he preached the gospel. And he was, at the age of 72, he was murdered. But he established seven churches in India. And the church in India is still going strong. The Mar Thomas Church. And he's buried in India. Thomas saw enough of Jesus to put his faith and put feet on his faith and go and do what Jesus said. We just sang that great hymn, Here I Am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling in the night. I preached years ago in a small town in Mississippi, and a man came up to me. He was in his 40s, and he said, I believe that God is calling me to ministry. And I wanted to say, you're too old to start now. But I did. And he became a minister of the gospel. Anybody here ready to hear the call? You want to live? I had one fellow tell me, he said, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm in school now. I'm in university. I'm studying, going to study medicine. I said, you know what? You can break all the broken bones and arms and legs you want to, but someday you're going to bury that whole body. But if you lead a soul to Christ, you've got them forever. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so he became a minister, a missionary, and now he's retired. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love to us. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, that we may serve you, that we may rejoice in Thomas's faith, but that it may not take away from the reality of our own personal connection and faith in you. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and receive the benediction, and then we will uh, be dismissed, and we'll sing because he lives, and then... If you're up to it, there's a donut for you in the palm room. Mm -hmm. Now, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, means the smile of his face, and help you hear his word whisper deep in your soul where only you and God live. Well done, good and faithful servant. Those are the words we want to hear. <coughs> be not afraid of the mystery of life. I'm in the mist and I'm in the mystery. And may God give you his perfect peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sing with me, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Before you leave, be sure to say, welcome to Sean.